Hello, everyone. I'm Jacob Stein, and welcome to this presentation on advanced planning with trusts. I'm a practicing attorney in Los Angeles, and my practice focuses on private wealth planning, which means that I do a lot of work with fairly sophisticated trust structures, estate planning structures, and all sorts of domestic and international tax structures. So today we're going to be speaking in this presentation about advanced planning with trusts. And this will cover all sorts of different uses of trusts in their more sophisticated form. Before we get into, I guess, the advanced and more sophisticated uses of trusts, which will span many different subjects from tax planning to asset protection and the like, uh, let's all get on the same page and talk about uh, trusts in general, just a little bit, because there are some very interesting concepts, even when we're talking about trusts on a more fundamental level, that I think everyone needs to know and understand and be on the same page about. And the first thing that I want you to sort of keep in mind, and likely you may already know this, is that a trust is not a legal person, a trust is not a legal entity, a trust is an agreement. Really, it's just a private contract between two parties. It is a private agreement between the set law of the trust, right? The person establishing the trust, the person transferring assets to the trust, and the trustee of the trust. And it's just that. It's a private contractual agreement. Now, perhaps a trust agreement in some ways is a little different than, let's say, your joint venture agreement or an employment agreement. But it is just that. It is an agreement. And because a trust is an agreement, it applies certain sort of unique characteristics. One, because a trust is an agreement, it cannot, in a technical sense, own assets. What do you mean it cannot own assets? We've heard of people transferring assets to trusts all the time. I myself have a trust that owns assets. Well, we say things like a trust owns assets really is a shorthand reference to what is actually going on. A trust is an agreement. An agreement cannot own assets. When we say that a trust owns assets or when we say that we have transferred assets into a trust, what we are really saying is that we have transferred assets to the trustee of the trust. What we are really saying is that the trustee of the trust holds legal title to the assets, but not the trust itself. If you think about it, what happens if we are transferring legal title of the assets to the trustee of the trust? Because the trustee does not like fully own the asset, right? The, the trustee of a trust does not have a fee simple interest in the asset that we are transferring to the trust. The trustee just holds legal title and he is holding legal title for someone else's benefit, right? For the benefit of the trust's beneficiaries. So the interesting thing and the important thing that happens when we transfer ownership of assets into a trust is that we are splitting up the ownership of the asset into two separate bundles of rights, right? We have the legal title of the assets and that goes to the trustee of the trust and we have an equitable interest in the assets and that goes to the beneficiaries of the trust. And it's uh, this sort of separation of an asset or a fee simple interest in an asset into these two separate bundles of rights that makes the trust so unique and that allows us to do a lot of the planning and the structuring that we will cover in this presentation. And then uh, to me, the other important concept that flows from the fact that the trust is just an agreement and not anything else is that because it is an agreement, because it is a private contract, there is virtually no limitation on how we can structure this contractual agreement. Now, it is true that there are certain threshold requirements that need to be satisfied to have a valid trust agreement. Right? We need to have an intention to create a trust. There must be purpose to it. There, may, there must be ascertainable beneficiaries and the like. But once we satisfy these basic threshold requirements, how we structure the trust is entirely up to us. 
you want to distribute the beneficiary A on Tuesdays in cash and to beneficiary B on Wednesdays in carrots, you can do that. Right? The law does not restrict it. The law would not allow you to do something that is illegal or that violates public policy. But those are fairly common sense limitations. Right? So once you get past that, how we structure a trust is entirely up to us. Which leads to an important conclusion, which is the following. Pretty much every time you have a question about a trust, can we do this? How does that work? What is possible? The answer almost always is, it depends. What does it depend on? Well, it depends on us. It depends on how we structured the trust. And we'll go through this uh, over the course of this presentation, and you will see in some particular instances how the structuring of the trust and the consequences of the flow do depend on us and how we have a free hand in structuring the trust in a way that works for us. But so please keep in mind that it is a private contractual agreement and that how we structure the trust is up to us. In this presentation, we're going to focus on an irrevocable trust. An irrevocable trust is very different, very distinct from a trust that is revocable, not just because the term is slightly different, but because it leads to all sorts of different consequences, this distinction between revocable uh, and irrevocable. So the trusts that are used in more complex planning, like special needs planning, asset protection, tax planning, these trusts are always irrevocable. And trusts that are revocable are used in more basic estate planning and probate avoidance, and in some very basic estate tax planning. Uh, and in this presentation, because we are talking about advanced planning with trusts, uh, we are necessarily referring to irrevocable trust, because that is really where the advanced planning takes place. So when we are speaking about an irrevocable trust, for a lot of people, a certain barrier goes up right away. Um, we don't want to do anything that's irrevocable. We are reluctant to transfer assets into an irrevocable trust. What will happen if tomorrow we change our mind? What will happen if tomorrow our circumstances change? Well, what will happen if tomorrow our relationship with the parties in the trust will change, like our relationship with the beneficiaries or our relationship with the trustee of the trust? Uh, and those are all very valid concerns. And I would like to start this presentation, sort of the substantive part of the presentation, by uh, addressing those concerns. Because unless we can get past these concerns, everything else that follows is a moot point because we will have a hard time convincing our clients of setting up these structures and doing these things that we'll discuss later. So how do we maintain control over an irrevocable trust? What can we do? What can we not do? What sort of assurances can we offer to our clients when we are using um, irrevocable trust? So I often tell my clients that we are able to set up an irrevocable trust that will work in much the same way as a trust that is revocable. And I think to a lot of clients, that is very surprising. I think to a lot of practitioners, it is surprising just because we are so used of how we think of irrevocable trusts, right? We've all started, studied the irrevocable trusts in law school, or at least many of us have studied irrevocable trusts in law schools. Um, and we sort of have a sense of how these trusts work, right? And we know that that word irrevocable does describe a trust that is perhaps cast in stone, a trust that cannot be amended, cannot be changed, where we have lost the ability to retrieve our assets out of the trust, where we have lost our ability to change our mind or adjust to changing circumstances. And that's what an irrevocable trust is. That is uh, certainly supported by hundreds of years of irrevocable trusts in the English common law system. Right? For the past, I don't know, 400 years or so, however long we've had irrevocable trusts in the English common law, these really have been structures that were intentionally cast in stone. Right? The whole purpose initially behind an irrevocable trust 
was to transfer your assets into a structure that cannot later be changed, right? So that the person who is transferring assets into the trust must continue to exert control over those assets by making sure that the rules he has created around those assets, right, the terms of the trust, cannot later be changed by the successor trustee or by the beneficiaries. And certainly even today, we can, we can draft an irrevocable trust that will work exactly like that. And it truly will be irrevocable and it will not be subject to any sort of an amendment provision. It turns out that while we can do that, we do not have to. And I would like to spend some time discussing uh, how that would work. So, first of all, what is an irrevocable trust? Like, how do we know? How do we distinguish between a trust that is revocable and a trust that is irrevocable? And I think for a lot of us, it's something that is a bit intuitive at this point in our practices. We kind of know it when we see it. But um, other than reading the trust instrument, which will usually expressly say that the trust is, let's say, irrevocable, which is the only way to make it irrevocable is to state so in the trust, uh, the law does have a provision that defines when do we have a trust that is revocable and when do we have a trust that is irrevocable and what specifically does it mean? Like, What must the trust have? To qualify as an irrevocable trust. It turns out that the law provides that every trust is revocable unless there is an express statement to the contrary in the trust agreement, right? So every trust is revocable unless we intentionally make it irrevocable. And what is an irrevocable trust? Well, one way to answer that question is to say, well, there is a sentence in the trust that says that cannot be revoked. But that's a bit uh, circular. Like, what does that actually mean in the technical aspect when we say that a trust is irrevocable? And usually when I'm lecturing on this, uh, at least in front of a live audience, you know, the questions that I will get are, well, if the trust is irrevocable, uh, it means it cannot be amended. It means it cannot be terminated. It means we have lost control. And all of those may be true, but not necessarily so, because the legal definition of an irrevocable trust is very narrow. So if you look at your state law, you see what is an irrevocable trust, it will say, and this is based on the Uniform Trust Code, so I'm going to venture to guess that this is pretty much identical in every state. The law will say that a trust is irrevocable if the set law, the person transferring the assets to the trust, has not retained the power to get his assets back. To phrase it in a different way, the settlor has not retained the power to revoke the transfer of the assets. And that's what the revocable versus irrevocable describes. It doesn't describe the trust itself as being revocable. Right? The trust can be terminated. Trust cannot be revoked. What we are revoking is not the trust instrument. We are revoking the transfer of the assets to the trust. And if we revoke the transfer, the assets go back where they came from, meaning to the set law of the trust. So the trust is deemed irrevocable if the set law has the power to get his assets back, to revoke the transfer. If we include a sentence in the trust agreement that says this trust is irrevocable, then it is an irrevocable trust because including that sentence means that we are stripping away from the set lord the power to get his assets back, which is fine. If your intention is to create a truly irrevocable trust that is cast in stone, where your client will, re will lose control over the assets placed into the trust, that is a perfectly fine way to do that, and certainly how it has been done for hundreds of years. But you will probably find that in many, many cases, our clients are looking to set up an irrevocable trust, but they do not want to lose control, right? And why is that? Well, it's because no one wakes up in the morning and says, you know, what I'd like to do today after my morning coffee and a croissant, I'd like to set up an irrevocable trust. It's sort of been on my bucket list 
Right? No one has ever said that. An irrevocable trust is a means to an end. Right? You want an irrevocable trust because you're looking to protect assets from claims of creditors. You want to set up an irrevocable trust because you want to minimize the estate tax. Things of that nature, right? It's a means to an end. And why is it that important for clients to retain control? Well, because they don't really want an irrevocable trust. They just want the result. But what if tomorrow they no, long, no longer need that result or it's no longer relevant or they have changed their mind or something more important comes their way, right? And they want the ability to get the assets out of the trust and do something else with those assets. Restructure this whole thing somehow. Very, very often our clients will find that it's important for them to retain control over the assets placed into this irrevocable trust. And we need to find a way to grant them that control. One way we have been able to do that is by remembering that a trust is deemed irrevocable if the settlor of the trust, the person setting up the trust, has not retained the power to get his assets back. You're probably sitting there and thinking to yourself, why is he repeating himself? What am I missing? Well, notice the difference in the language. In a traditional irrevocable trust, the language will usually say, this trust is irrevocable. In a more modern way of drafting these types of trusts, and the way we draft them, we will usually say that the settlor has not retained the power to revoke the trust. What is the distinction, the nuance? Well, the nuance is that in a traditional way of drafting, we say the trust is irrevocable, period. Full stop, which means that no one has the power to return the assets back to the settlor. In a more modern way of drafting these trusts, we will say that the settlor has not retained the power to get his assets back, which is not the same as saying that this power does not exist. In the modern way of drafting an irrevocable trust, we will say that the settlor of the trust does not retain the power to get his assets back. Perhaps the power exists and resides with someone else. There is no longer a blanket prohibition on the ability to revoke a trust and return the assets to the settlor. Right? So that's the first very, very important distinction. And I will tell you that over the past 10 years approximately, I have drafted literally hundreds of irrevocable trusts I do not recall the last time I drafted an irrevocable trust that was truly irrevocable, meaning where there was a blanket prohibition on the world's ability to revoke the trust. We just need to take that power away from the settlor of the trust. We do not want to lose it entirely. Perhaps we would like to preserve this power with someone else, just not with the settlor of the trust. Imagine, if we can preserve this power with someone else, someone that our client trusts, someone who will hopefully carry out our client's wishes, now there is that glimmer of hope. Oh, tomorrow maybe I can get my assets back by having someone else exercise the power to revoke. So who is going to hold the power? Well, usually this power is granted to a person that is referred to as a trust protector. And it's just a cool term. It has no meaning in and of itself. Um, and this trust protector will be a new office created within the trust instrument. The powers of this office will be exercised in a non-fiduciary capacity. And the trust protector will be given certain powers over the trust. So the first one is the power to revoke the trust and return the assets to the settlor. What else can we give to the trust protector? Well, the powers that are commonly given to protectors will be the power to make changes to the trust agreement, to amend the trust agreement. Perhaps the power to change up the beneficiaries of the trust. Certainly the power to remove and replace the trustee perhaps the power to revoke the trust, so not just to terminate it, but also, sorry, not just to revoke it, but also to terminate it. 
Of course, the distinction is that when we revoke the trust, the assets go back to the set lore, and when we terminate a trust, the assets get distributed to the beneficiaries, which is not one and the same. And the trust protector may be given the power to veto distributions or to force distributions, to change the governing law of the trust, to switch between grantor and non-grantor income tax status for the trust, and many other powers. And our job is to try to figure out what are the powers that we would like the trust protector to have in any given case and to preserve those powers. And trusts that incorporate a strong trust protector drafting are really trusts that are flexible, that are not cast in stone, where our client, the person transferring the assets to the trust, is able to retain and continue to exercise control. And that's just great, right? We've taken a concept that existed for hundreds of years and has been perceived as being very unfriendly to being something that is flexible and easy to use. And very often I will tell my clients, you can think of these trusts that we are creating for you as an irrevocable living trust. And it works like a living trust, but it's also irrevocable. Right? Because when we're talking about asset protection planning, when we're talking about income tax planning and estate tax planning, we want a trust that is irrevocable as to our client. We just need to meet the minimum requirement for the trust to be deemed uh, an irrevocable trust, and we do not need to go past that minimum requirement. Right? So our client will fund his assets into the trust, and the trust will provide that our client cannot get his assets back. He does not hold that power. He himself or herself, they do not hold that power. They've appointed someone else who will hold that power. And of course, that someone else cannot be deemed an agent of our client. There cannot be a principal-agent relationship. And it's very important to sever any possibility of that relationship in the trust agreement by providing that the trust protector does not have to carry out the wishes of the settlor. And if you say that in the trust agreement, you have terminated any possibility of a principal-agent relationship. And what a great concept, the trust protector. I've now drafted literally hundreds of trusts with trust protector clauses, and clients love the fact that they're able to retain control over the assets they have placed into the trust. Right, so regardless of the reason we are setting up this irrevocable trust, in almost every single case, our clients want to retain control, and we can now give it to them. What else can we do with an irrevocable trust that's a bit unorthodox? Well, we can make sure that this irrevocable trust is ignored for tax purposes. What do you mean, Jacob? What kind of tax purposes? All tax purposes. We can draft an irrevocable trust that is ignored for income tax purposes. We can draft an irrevocable trust that is ignored for gift and estate tax purposes. And it is possible to do this. It is possible to draft an irrevocable trust in such a way. Again, remember, clients may want this trust today. They may want the result that this trust gets them today. They also don't know what the future holds. So they want to keep this ability up their sleeve to terminate the trust should they decide to do so. So a couple of uh, considerations for some of you listening to this presentation. Uh, one is that if you are transferring real estate into a trust, the transfer must be in writing and usually done by either a warranty deed or a grand deed, depending on the state you're in. In the Ninth Circuit, um, it is maybe possible to avoid probate on assets that have not been retitled into a trust by showing that there was an intention to do so. Um, and also be mindful that whenever we are transferring real estate into a trust, if there is a mortgage encumbering the real estate, uh, you may be triggering the due on sale clause. Now, there is a federal law known as the Garn St. Germain Act that provides that lenders are not allowed to exercise the due on sale clause 
when a property is transferred into a trust, but there are certain conditions as to the kind of trust that must be and how it's structured. Um, but this is something to be uh, mindful of. And then finally, for those of you who practice in community property states on the West Coast mostly, uh, you need to be mindful of what happens to community property when it gets transferred into a trust. Does it remain community property? Does it become separate property? Is there a way to do that if we want to or preserve it if we want to, right? Uh, all kinds of uh, very particular considerations. Okay, so I'm kind of rushing through these topics a bit, but hopefully you guys can stay with me uh, because there is a lot to cover in this presentation. So we are today talking about, again, only about a revocable trust because that's where all the sophisticated planning takes place. And we can structure nowadays an irrevocable trust in such a way so that we do retain control over the assets that have been transferred into the trust. So our first planning technique uh, is an income tax planning technique. And this income tax planning technique is often referred to as a ding or a ning or a wing, where the first letter uh, represents the name of the state where the trust has been established. So a ding is set up in Delaware, and the ning is set up in Nevada, and a wing is set up in Wyoming, as an example, right? And you, you can have this in many different states. So, and uh, I'll use dings as, as an example. A ding fully uh, stands for Delaware Intentional Non-Grantor Trust. Delaware Intentional Non-Grantor Trust. And again, you can set up these non-grantor trust in, in any state, but if you're looking to engage in some income tax planning, then really you want to set this up in a state that has no state income tax. Um, so if you have a trust that is a non-grantor trust and grantor versus non-grantor, that is an income tax concept found in sections uh, 671 through 679 of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, and this concept really determines whether a trust is its own taxpayer or whether it is ignored for income tax purposes. So if you have a trust that is grantor, right, it's, it is a grantor trust uh, under these code sections, then the trust is ignored for income tax purposes as if it does not exist. It's like a, a limited liability company that is a disregarded entity. Yes, it has some validity, some significance under state law, but for federal income tax purposes, if the trust is grantor, we ignore it as if it does not exist. And a non-grantor trust is its own taxpayer, and it must file its own income tax return, and it must pay its own income tax at its own tax rate. And that's a non-grantor trust. So the ding, ning, wing, and so forth structures stand for trusts that are non-grantor, meaning the trust is its own taxpayer. It will be taxed on its own income. And we establish these trusts in a state that has no income tax. So I live and practice in Los Angeles, and uh, California is a very high income tax state. Right, Our income tax rate is over 13%. The Californians, in addition to being taxed on their federal tax returns, right, are also taxed fairly significantly for California income tax purposes. And a lot of Californians, and this is true not just of Californians, this is true of anyone who lives in a state that has a relatively high income tax rate, certainly, for example, New York, will fall into this category as well. And our clients in California, New York, and other high income tax states may want to produce, uh, sorry, may want to place their income producing assets into one of these intentional non grantor trusts. Because if the assets are owned by an intentional non grantor trust, then our client no longer owns those assets. And our client is no longer generating income on those assets. 
Where is this income being generated now? Well, it turns out this income is now being generated in a state that has no income tax. And whereas yesterday these assets were in, let's say, California, subject to 13% income tax rate, today they are deemed to be in Delaware at a 0% tax rate. And all we've done, all we have done is we have established the trust in Delaware, right, governed by Delaware law, and we have transferred assets into that Delaware trust. And as soon as we have transferred the assets into the Delaware trust, we no longer have assets there in California. And therefore, we don't have anything in California that is subject to the California income tax. And one more time, uh, this is um, applicable to all states where you have a significant income tax. This is not California specific. So there, there's a Supreme Court, US Supreme, Supreme Court uh, decision, I believe in the summer of 2019. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the case, but it involved uh, North Carolina Department of, Department of Revenue, where North Carolina attempted to exert jurisdiction over a trust uh, that was established by a North Car Carolina resident, but the trust was subject to Delaware law and the beneficiary, beneficiaries of the trust did not live in the Carolinas. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, well, North Carolina, you have no jurisdiction over this trust. You cannot tax this trust because this trust is governed by Delaware law. The trustees in Delaware, the beneficiaries are outside of North Carolina. You have no nexus to tax this trust. So, you know, given the Supreme Court case, we know with a high degree of certainty that these trusts do work. We use things and things and the like uh, in two sets of circumstances. One, when we have a client with a very significant passive income portfolio and uh, they do not want the income being generated by that portfolio, continue to be subject to state income tax. So then we move the portfolio into this trust and avoid the state income tax, right? So it's still subject to the federal income tax. There's no way for us to avoid that, but we get around the state income tax. Or where we have an asset that we expect will go through a significant appreciation event. Like for example, an interest in a private company that we expect will be sold to private equity one day or will go public one day. Or something else will happen that will drive up the value. So today, before there has been this appreciation event, uh, we will transfer the asset into uh, an intentional non-grantor trust. Uh, and when the asset eventually is sold and the gain is generated, the gain is generated now, let's say in Delaware, that has no state income tax. And there is no gain in California, New York, or other place that has a high tax. So this is uh, becoming more and more of a frequently used income tax planning structure. Now, moving on to state tax planning. Let's talk a little bit about what are called intentionally defective grant or trusts. So the intentionally defective grant or trust is an estate tax planning tool. So what is the ding, ning, and so forth? There was an income tax planning tool, right? We are looking to avoid the state income tax. An intentionally defective grant or trust in Egypt is an estate tax, a federal estate tax planning tool. And I will give you a real life historical example to demonstrate how these trusts work and what they are all about. And this is probably for larger estates, one of the most commonly used um, estate tax reduction tools, the intentionally defective grant for trust. So this, uh, this is a, a real life historical example, and this goes back all the way to the 1930s. So sometime around, uh, I don't remember the exact year, but let's say 1935, uh, Pierre Dupont engages in probably the first kind of well-known estate tax planning transaction. Pierre Dupont takes the assets of the Dupont Corporation and he transfers the assets of the Dupont Corporation uh, to his kids. He sells the assets, uh, sorry, not the assets of the Dupont Corporation. <laughs> he, he sells the shares that he owns in the Dupont Corporation to his kids. Um, and I don't believe he sold all of the shares, but a significant chunk 
that at the time in 1935 was worth something like 15 million dollars, one five, 15 million dollars. He sells the shares in the Japan Corporation to the kids. He sells the shares in exchange for a promissory note payable to him for his life. Uh, his life expectancy at the time of the transaction is about 15 years. So the note pays him about a million dollars a year. So the ownership of the shares goes to his kids and Japan now owns a promissory note. He's getting paid a million dollars a year, except that Japan does not survive for 15 years. As a matter of fact, he goes on to survive for 30 years following this transaction. So while we moved 15 million of stock out of his estate and to his kids, we replaced it with $30 million of cash flow plus interest. And the question is the following, was this a good or a bad estate tax planning transaction? And the relevant question, of course, is the following. What was the value of the stock 30 years later when Pierre Dupont died? And it turns out that the value of the stock 30 years later was $500 million. And that $500 million of stock was not subject to the estate tax. It was not. It's a fantastic estate tax planning transaction, right? Uh, he reduced his estate tax by some monumental number. We all would like to be able to do something like that for our clients. So in hindsight, fantastic play. Think about it from DuPont's point of view at the time he entered into this transaction. Did he know with certainty that when he sold the shares to the kids in exchange for the promissory note, did he know with certainty that the shares will go up in value? Did he know with certainty that they will go, go up in value a lot? Of course not, right? He was betting on it. He was assuming that it would. And he paid a fairly high price for that bet. What is the price that he paid? Well, when he sold the shares to the kids, he had to pay tax to sell the shares. Right? Because the only way you can transfer an asset from one taxpayer to another taxpayer is either by sale or a gift. In the world of tax, there is no other option. Anytime you move a valuable appreciated asset from one taxpayer to another taxpayer, it either will be a taxable, taxable sale or a taxable gift. Right, so Pierre Dupont chose to sell the shares to the kids, but he had a $15 million capital gain. And what would have happened if the stock did not go up and down? What would have happened if the stock went down and down, right? So he was taking a bet. And imagine telling your client that, listen, we're going to do this transaction, and if everything pans out, your kids will pay less in estate taxes. But regardless of what happens, I will guarantee with 100% certainty that today you will pay a tax to try this transaction and you know give it a chance and see if it works or not. How many clients are going to take that risk? So to the rescue comes the intentionally defective grant or trust, the only structure known to us that will replace, well, not replace, the only structure known to us that will give us a third way for tax purposes of transferring an asset from one taxpayer to another taxpayer, something that is not a sale and something that is not a gift. An intentionally defective grant or trust is an irrevocable trust where our client, the person setting up the trust and transferring the assets to the trust does not retain any control, which means that the assets of the trust are excluded from our client's estate. But this trust that we are setting up for income tax purposes will be drafted to be a trust that is deemed a grantor trust. And as we've explained previously, a trust that is a grantor trust that is ignored for income tax purposes. Now note that it's not ignored for estate tax purposes. It is not ignored under state law. It is ignored for income tax purposes only. 
So what happens as a result of selling now these DuPont shares to an intentionally defective grant or trust? Well, let's look at the same transaction that Pierre DuPont did, but instead of him selling to his kids and generating a taxable event, now he is selling into an intentionally defective grant or trust for the benefit of his kids. There is no gift, there is no taxable gift on the sale, right? Because he's going to sell in exchange for fair market value. Meaning that if we have $15 million worth of stock, the trust is going to pay our client with a $15 million promissory note. There's no gift element to the transaction. Okay, so we've avoided the gift tax by selling for fair market value. What about the income tax? Well, there is no income tax because the trust for income tax purposes is a grant or trust, which means it is ignored, which means that our client, the one who set up this trust, will be treated as the owner of the trust's assets for income tax purposes. Which is another way of saying that for income tax purposes, he is selling the shares of stock to himself. He's selling the shares of stock to himself which means the basis of the shares do not change. There is no gain on the sale because for income tax purposes, there is no gain. There's no sale has taken place. The trust is ignored for income tax purposes. Okay. So for income tax purposes, nothing has changed. But for estate tax purposes, this is a valid trust. And the shares are now out of his estate and they will, re will, they will appreciate in value in the hands of the trust. And into his estate, we bring a promissory note that will never appreciate in value. Right? And so we have allowed Pierre Dupont to complete his estate freeze transaction, right, to replace an appreciating asset with an asset that will never appreciate in value. And we've allowed him to complete this transaction without any tax consequences today. Right? So now we are able to give the Pierre Duponts of the world Obviously, our clients do not need to be that wealthy for this to work. They just need to have a taxable estate. But we can give them a bite of the apple of reducing their estate tax without any tax liability today. So the one word of caution that I have about idgits is that you have to be really careful when you have an estate that is borderline taxable. And that's true for any estate tax planning that we do. Currently, the estate tax exemption is fairly high, right? It's $11 million per person or 11 and a half, something like that. But that exemption is going to sunset, I think, what, in 2025? And it's going to go down to about $3 million per person. And then who knows how the law may be changed in the subsequent years. Um, and if we have an estate, let's say, that where, where a client will uh, die before the exemption sunsets, right? so the exemption is still high, it's still $11 million, but the value of the client's assets for whatever reason decline, and they no longer have a taxable estate, then there is no value to this kind of a transaction right? because they don't have a taxable estate. So what's the purpose of reducing their estate tax? And what's the downside? Always a downside, right? What's the downside of the client entering into this transaction? Well, now the shares of the DuPont Corporation are not owned by Pierre DuPont. They're owned by this trust, which means that when Pierre DuPont dies, what happens to the basis of the shares, the income tax basis of the shares? And the answer is nothing happens. That is correct, because he does not own the shares on his death. So we do not get a step up in basis to fair market value. Right? That, that is the downside with a structure like this to avoid the estate tax. And given the choice, we 99% of the time will choose to avoid the estate tax and sacrifice the basis step up. The estate tax is a higher rate of tax. There's a much higher certainty that they will have, we will have to pay it shortly after that. But if the estate falls in value and the exemptions remain high, there may not be a taxable estate. And then we've done something for the client that they do not need and gives them a negative result. So if you are doing these types of transactions, make sure please that you
include the proper disclaimers in your engagement agreements. Make sure the client is informed of the risk and they take the risk. Okay, let's move on. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, asset protection in the time we have remaining, which is about uh, 15 minutes or so, and how trusts are used for asset protection, and then kind of the related topics of special needs planning. Um, and special needs planning, just so we all understand what that is, uh, usually these are trusts used to qualify for government benefits, right? So these are trusts established for beneficiaries who have special needs, uh, usually beneficiaries that somehow are disabled, physically or mentally. Um, and uh, often we would like these beneficiaries to qualify for government benefits, but if these benefits are needs-based, um, then uh, you know having assets disqualifies the beneficiary. So what is often done is that assets are transferred into uh, in a revocable trust so that the beneficiary is not deemed to be the owner of such assets. Okay, so asset protection and special needs uh, uh, planning are uh, kind of similar because our objective is the same. We want to take an asset that our client owns and make it into an asset that the client does not own. So with asset protection, our goal is also very narrow, just like with special needs planning. With asset protection, our goal is to protect our client's assets from claims of creditors. And what kind of creditors are we talking about? Well, it can be any type of a creditor. This can be a client that is pursued by a plaintiff in tort litigation. This can be a client who is being pursued by a lender for, let's say, defaulting on a personal guarantee. This can be some uh, large government agency like the FDA or the FTC or the SEC or what have you that is investigating our client. Um, it can be any sort of a, a set of circumstances where our client's assets are exposed to a claim by a third party. Right? So asset protection deals with how do we protect those assets? How do we make it more difficult, more expensive for others to reach our assets? So again, a very narrow goal here. And trusts are very frequently used in asset protection planning because a trust allows us to accomplish what is effectively is the, I would say the holy goal, the, the, the holy grail uh, of asset protection planning, which is to say that the client no longer owns the asset and to be able to say truthfully, the client no longer owns this asset, asset because the ownership of the asset has been transferred into an irrevocable trust but to do it in such a way so that he can retain control over the asset and retain the ability to transfer the ownership of the asset back into his name. So how do we retain that control? Well, that's a topic that we spent some time on in the beginning when we talked about the proper way to structure an irrevocable trust and the use of trust protectors. Very frequently, we will make sure that our irrevocable asset protection trusts and asset protection trusts are always irrevocable, uh, that our irrevocable asset protection trust is drafted uh, in such a way so that uh, there is the ability to revoke it. It's just not held by our client. It's not held by the settlor of the trust. And we also will uh, incorporate the trust protector concept into our trust agreement, and this trust protector will be given, you know, lots of different powers. Um, you do want, as a reminder, you do want to make sure that there is no principal agent relationship between the set law of the trust and the trust protector. And <clears throat> you sever it in the trust agreement by providing that the trust protector does not have to carry out the wishes of the set law. But so long as you have the protector and the, the settlor is on good terms with the protector, and so long as you give the settlor the power to remove and replace the protector, you have an irrevocable trust where your client has retained control. And when the creditors come knocking, the client is able to say, well, you know what, these assets over there, I do not own those assets. They are owned by an irrevocable trust. I transferred those assets to that irrevocable trust. These are no longer my assets, and you cannot take them from me. 
So for uh, to have a good asset protection trust, you need the trust, as I said, that is irrevocable. The trust must incorporate what's called the spendthrift clause, meaning that the beneficiary is prevented from assigning, anticipating uh, distributions, right? Distributions are sort of at the mercy of the trustee. And the trust is discretionary, meaning that the trustee is given as much power as possible when it comes to making distributions. So we give the trustee the power to determine when and how much to distribute and to who to distribute to. And the more discretion we can give to the trustee, the more protection the trust will uh, offer. In, in most states, we cannot use what's known as a self-settled trust to protect assets. And I would say, and this is my opinion, that in all states, we should not use a self-settled trust. So there are now about 15 states that allow the use of self-settled trusts to protect assets from claims of creditors. Um, so what is a self-settled trust? Just very briefly, it is a trust that you set up for your own benefit. Where the settlor of the trust, the person transferring the assets to the trust, has retained, to some extent, a beneficial interest in those assets. It may be the full beneficial interest in those assets. It may be just a partial interest in the assets, right? But the settlor has retained a beneficial interest in the assets. That's a self-settled trust. And the law of most states provides very specifically that there is no asset protection in the trust that is self-settled. Creditors are allowed to reach the assets of a trust like that. As of today, there are approximately 15 states that say that if you set up a, you know, an irrevocable trust that has a spendthrift clause, uh, you have creditor protection um, even if it is self-settled. States like Alaska, Nevada, Delaware, and the like. Um, the problem is that, first of all, you may have a client who doesn't live in one of those states or has assets outside of those states. And then the question is, will other states, uh, for public policy reasons, uh, allow or not allow creditors to reach the assets of the self sell trust, right? which is a bit of an unknown because there really has not been any litigation on this topic. And then second, in the context of a bankruptcy filing, and you know, when clients have credit issues, a bankruptcy filing is always in the cards. It's always possible. Uh, in the event of a possible bankruptcy filing, uh, there's a 10 year look back on the transfer of assets to a self settled trust. 10 year look back. I mean, that's like forever, right? So we generally try to avoid using self-settled trusts, and we always have clients set up trusts for the benefit of kids, family members, and the like. Given that we have appointed a trust protector with the power to change the beneficiaries of the trust, it's usually not a big deal. Appoint one person as the beneficiary today, and tomorrow you can change who the beneficiary is and bring your client in as the beneficiary um, of the trust. So I, I, as much as possible, almost always, I have to say, I avoid the use of self-settled trusts, either uh, either for asset protection uh, and certainly for special needs planning. So this brings us to the use of overseas trusts. Uh, obviously, the United States is not the only country that has trust law. All of the English common law countries have trusts. And today, more and more civil law countries have trust laws as well. Some of them model it on uh, English trust law, and some of them create their own stuff. Um, but in the English common law countries, their trust laws would be very, very similar to our trust laws. And as a matter of fact, um, for example, these uh, 15 or so jurisdictions in the United States that have modernized their trust laws, for example, to allow self-settled trusts as asset protection uh, tools to uh, revise how the rule against perpetuities work and kind of doing away with that arcane uh, rule that we all studied in law school to something that is understandable, like, you know, 300 years or what have you. Um, 
a lot of these states have modeled their trust law on the laws of certain uh, offshore jurisdictions that certainly have pioneered and modernized uh, the trust law that we know of today. So why and when would we want to set up a trust overseas? Um, very often this is uh, a client in pursuit also of asset protection planning. Sometimes this is a client in pursuit of privacy. Uh, and then sometimes this is a client in pursuit of tax planning. So primarily we see this in the context of asset protection planning or privacy. So first by privacy, uh, just to get it out of the way, uh, whenever we do something overseas, uh, the ability of a plaintiff or a creditor to discover that information, to subpoena, reach that information is very, very limited. Um, so, you know, a lot of our Asian clients, uh, Asian meaning out of Asia, clients that live in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam and the like, they love placing assets into trusts in offshore jurisdictions. Um, so that is, uh, that is done very frequently. Often they may not want their home governments to know about these assets. Sometimes they may not want their competitors or other family members to know about these assets. Uh, but in uh, many Asian cultures, for a lot of people, privacy is sort of a very important objective. For our U.S. and European clients, uh, it's, it's purely asset protection usually, meaning that we are looking to shield assets from claims of creditors. I have been practicing asset protection now for close to 20 years. I've completed, I would say, over 2,000 asset protection transactions. I've literally done it all and seen it all. Um, and there is no structure, in my opinion, that works as well in protecting assets from credit claims as an offshore trust. Why is that? Well, one is, as I mentioned, access to information, right? If you are a plaintiff and you're looking to pursue assets overseas, pursuing assets in an offshore trust is very, very tough because no one is going to give you the time of day and no one is going to cooperate with your subpoenas and document production requests and the like, right? Because the U.S. court has no jurisdiction over the offshore uh, service providers uh, that uh, may be administering the trust. So that's number one. Uh, number two is just the perception of it, meaning that when something is overseas, it is perceived as, uh, you know, being very difficult to reach, very expensive to reach. And in the vast, vast, vast majority of the cases, we will never see a plaintiff or a creditor try to pursue uh, any sort of an offshore structure and certainly not offshore trust. Um, so an offshore trust will look uh, a lot like a U.S. trust, meaning from the trust instrument itself, you usually cannot tell whether it's a U.S.-based or a foreign-based trust. And the only distinction is somewhere within the trust agreement, there will be a reference to governing law, right? And that's kind of one of the cool thing about a trust agreement. Remember, it is a private contractual agreement. We get to pick our own governing law. Now, the choice of law we make within the trust instrument is binding only on the parties to the trust agreement. It is not binding on third-party creditors. A third-party creditor gets to look at things like, where is the trustee? Where is the trust being administered? Where are the beneficiaries of the trust to determine uh, whether it will be the law of, let's say, St. Vincent and the Grenadines that applies uh, to the trust or the law of their home state. But if we have set up this trust properly and if the trust owns assets that are outside of the United States, none of that may matter because the plaintiff, from a practical standpoint, may just be unable to reach the assets of this trust. And certainly the only time we are able to tell our client that your assets are pretty much unreachable now from a, you know, a credit or claim standpoint is when those assets are placed into uh, an offshore trust. Now, I'm kind of simplifying things for now because an offshore trust, sort of a generic term, there are different types of trusts. There are lots of different ways to set up these structures. Uh, many different jurisdictions you can use. You can have trusts that establish other trusts. You can have trusts that own companies that in turn own assets. The most important thing I would just keep in mind is that you do want to go to the right kind of jurisdiction. 
and there are some jurisdictions that are asset protection friendly that make it really, really difficult for a creditor to bust an asset protection trust and to reach the assets within the asset protection trust. And our favorite jurisdiction uh, for the past 10, 15 years has been St. Vincent uh, in the Caribbean. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of other nuances. There are a lot of other offshore structures that are used for asset protection. Trusts are just one of the structures. Uh, but it is one that we do favor, provided that the assets can be moved overseas. If there are no assets that are fungible, that are not liquid, an offshore trust is not going to do much. Um, so, you know, in, in an hour, there's only so much we can cover um, in a presentation like this. I would like you to keep in mind that trusts are a lot more flexible than many people suspect them to be. And I'm referring to revocable trusts. They can be drafted to be very, very, very flexible to allow our client to retain control over the trust and its assets. We get to pick what kind of tax consequences we will have from the trust. Will the trust be ignored for gift and estate tax purposes? Or will we have a completed transfer out of the estate? Will the trust be ignored for income tax purposes or not ignored, right? All of that is at our disposal. And then it's our choice because as I mentioned, the trust is a private contract and we get to decide uh, how it is structured. With that, I would like to thank you for listening. Again, I'm Jacob Stein. I practice with Aligned uh, in Los Angeles. I represent clients around the world and I will be always happy to help you and your clients. And if you have listened to this presentation and if you have questions on any of the subjects that I've covered, you are welcome to shoot me an email or call me. I will always be happy to answer your questions. Have a great day.